welcome back to your viewers and listeners. We are talking about the beloved book, Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre by Charlotte Bronte. Uh, today on the uh, whatever we're calling this podcast, podcast the podcast, uh, we're going to be talking about the themes of marriage, uh, specifically love versus autonomy. Uh, what else? So Tom? right off the bat, once Jane and Rochester's relationship begins, we can see that Rochester is a very passionate man. In fact, this is actually quite evident uh, before they even engage in any romantic affairs under any kind of cheap tree. Uh, but really, the main problem with that is that Jane Eyre has, for her entire life, has been torn between this this pole of autonomy and her duty from learning from the Lowood School. Uh, her chores specifically at, uh duty to uh religion christianity yes or god mm -hmm. specifically good point jillian jane is torn between the two poles of autonomy and passion uh her autonomy really comes about and is really given birth to in her schooling at lowwood school she has to follow a strict schedule uh there's a lot of religion uh learning and just general order that goes on at She's Lowood. She's beaten down. She's beaten down. She loses a lot of her fiery spirit that we see, uh, both in the Red Room and at her aunt, the Reed's house. Yep, yeah, but something she also learns while she's at the Lowood School and at the Reed's house is, well, not necessarily something she learns, but something she grows to desire is love, not just from a romantic perspective, but from any person. Just like, from others. Any, any person at all. From a young age, she did not have a lot of uh, close affection both in the romantic sense and also in the familial, uh, more friendly sense. And that's what makes her initial connection to Rochester so, like, like that's like what makes her inner turmoil so just like painful for her. Well, and then after advertising and moving to Thornfield and meeting Rochester, she sees this fiery, passionate man who has no respect for the order of uh, general society. Like politeness, you can see repeatedly that Rochester refuses to uh, cater to people's more traditional understandings of social uh, talking and um, interaction, like politeness. He just throws straight out the window. Um, he's very direct, but also very um, engaged in his emotions, I would mm -hmm. say. Um, and then this that, continues while she's... That is a problem for Jane, because her whole life, pretty much, except for as a child, she's been pretty... Um, definitely very restrained, repressed even, um, yet when she meets this Rochester character, she sees the full range of what her emotions can be, both through Rochester and also in her own passion for Rochester. This is further explored when she becomes married to Rochester. Uh, in fact, the main breaking point between her and Rochester is over the issue of autonomy in that Rochester's lack of respect for the rules in his attempt to pursue and marry Jane, despite his previous engagement, uh, he sees that he only loves Jane and that he has no passion for Bertha. Yet, uh, he's completely rejecting the rules of society at the time. Yeah. Rochester, who was previously engaged to this Bertha Mason character, uh, completely against the rules, tries to uh, eng become engaged to and also marry Jane Eyre. And then she just completely is like, no. Um, so she leaves him because the rules state that they cannot be together if he's already married. And then after doing so, she encounters the lovely and very autonomous Sinjin, who is strictly autonomous, no passion at all, also attempts to marry Jane, although he does not have a previous wife who is still alive. Mm. Um, but he does not marry her for the right reason. That reason is love, at least in Jane, uh, Jane's did, eyes it is. He didn't marry her. He tries to marry her, for, for not, not for love, but so that she can join him as a missionary to India. He also beats her down. She's like, yes. that's not cool. He also beats her down. With this, Jane realizes that she has to find a balance between autonomy and passion. And she sees that the only way she can do this is by coming back to Rochester. Her opposite in that he is mainly passion and very little autonomy. And while she is very much autonomy and very little passion, and she believes that if she becomes married to this man, then she can find a balance both for her and for Rochester. Moving into our next topic, traditional gender roles. How have they changed between well, now and then? Um. I will say that you do have to find a healthy balance between a lot of things. 
between personality and also attractiveness? Um, I feel like there is a lot of pressure to look a certain way. I know that um, the fashion industry is moving more towards inclusive body types, but there's still the... There's still a lot of backlash yeah, from yeah, there's both just, sides of the argument. And there's, there's still also just like a lot of feeling that you have to look a certain way for people to like you. And I mean, when you're growing up and when you're... Even as an when adult. You want to, when you want to be liked, both by, I don't know, just like people you're attracted to, but also just people in general for, you know, friendship's sake. There's just a lot on you to look a certain way and people won't like you if you look a certain way. I mean, I remember going through a lot of that when I was growing up. Um, and it sucked. But I feel like in Jane's case, it wasn't necessarily bodies so much as just like... Appealing to a common standard that was yeah. very common throughout all women. I feel like she... Like, when we're talking about Jane, she is common. She's ordinary. She's plain. Like, this is where plain Jane, I think, comes from. What made her feel less than, I think, in the novel was when she was... When when we were dealing with Blanche Ingram. And when she was kind of comparing herself to Blanche. And that's where she kind of got hit with, oh, I guess I'm not that special. Um, that's where a lot of that came in. But I also feel like there's, like, what Jane kind of touches on... Um, and one of the more um, famous quotes in the novel is how women are restrained and how women feel just the same as men and how women should have as just as much of a voice as men. And there's this overlying theme of imprisonment throughout the novel. So going back to the, um, the point of the standard, you can see that in uh, Jane Eyre's time in Victorian England, there's definitely a standard that women have to conform to, um, both in body shape in skill sets, we see a lot of the women have to learn piano and English and French and drawing as well, which is a very broad skill set that not a lot of women have today, or not a lot of people have today, in fact. But also there has to be a balance, because remember, there was uh, a bit where Blanche and um, her mother were, like, they, they weren't very nice to Adele, and Adele was this very, I wouldn't say flamboyant, but like very... She spends her skills in only two trees, really. Her singing, which isn't even that great, to be fair. And also her um, her fashion and her, her appearance, really. Yeah. and But she leaves a lot frivolous. to be... Frivolous. Yes, very was frivolous. Yeah. was the word that I was looking for. And you ha kind of have to find this middle ground between being as plain as Jane and being as frivolous as Adele. Because Blanche is kind of in this in-between area, just like being standardly pretty. Mm -hmm. I think that Blanche excels in... Uh, almost every area of that Victorian women were expected to uh, achieve. Yeah, I feel like in the novel, she kind of just re represented what a Victorian woman was supposed to look like. Yes, and then Plain Jane kind of stands in the middle between uh, the frivolous Adele, as you were saying, and uh, Blanche Ingram, the ideal woman. Although she is a little bit shallow and uh, still in that she's a little bit... Um, not the most intelligent woman, I would say. Right, but if you remember one of the um, reviews, like one of the Victor like when this book came out, one of the reviews of the book was criticizing the novel and criticizing Jane as a character for being too self-centered, and how how she was almost victimizing herself throughout the entire novel. Right, like not thanking anyone for anything, and so there is there's kind of the ideal. I feel like there's a bit of a difference between the standard Victorian woman in the book and the standard Victorian woman, like, reader at the time. Definitely, definitely. Uh, Jillian, as a modern woman, um, yes. would you say that religion matters to you in your whole life and also as, uh, in a relationship? Um, short answer, yes. I grew up in a, a pretty, pretty religious household and I still, like, I go to youth group still and I, uh, a lot of my friends are Christians and I don't, like... I don't think it, it, like it matters. I think in the long run, but like for being in high school, I don't think it mattered too much for early relationships and you know a lot of people I hung out with. But I think in the long run, I think one of the reasons why a lot of marriages have gone awry for other Christians I've known is because they've married people that aren't other Christians. And when you have these two very conflicting values that are the centers of like both of your lives and you, there's really nothing it's just like such a big part of your life that you can't come to a conclusion on um, with someone I think that it would cause a lot of problems and that's just what I've seen uh, throughout my life so yeah short answer yeah 
All right, I'm gonna take a step in. As someone who has not experienced many relationships, I would say that wow. uh, generally women have trended towards, or just people in general have trended towards um, a lack of religion. We've seen in the census yeah. that um, religion just isn't as big of a deal to Americans nowadays as it was um, even That's, 10 or 20 years yeah. ago. <laughs> Welcome back to our interview with uh, a bad impression of Jane Eyre and a bad impression of Rochester. Hello, uh, Welcome love. to you both. Hello. Alrighty, so, uh, do you, did you all at all marry for, uh, love or for money, do you think? I would say it was for love. I love you. I would also say it's for love. I love you too. Alright, so I will say, um, I'm not super knowledgeable about your relationship, but I will say that money was definitely a big contributor. I don't want to be a homewrecker here, but, um, Jane, I know that you would not marry your lovely husband, Rochester, without having at least a lump sum behind yourself so that you would be on the same social status. What do you think about that? Well, the problem was, you see, he had all the power in the relationship. I did. That's where I get off. And you see, I, I did not feel comfortable not having a little, or at least a little bit of power. So yeah, what's that, that, that dynamic took me a little bit of getting used to because I'm used to you know having all the powers as the man. Thank you, Rochester. As, you see, when I got my lovely lump of inheritance, I came back to see if my love was still there. I saw the house he burned down, and then I see that he lost his eyesight and he was really dependent on someone. So I could be that person he would be dependent on and it was just great because we had this relationship that was now balanced physically and and in money. See, when we when we almost got married the first time. I remember that. It was that, good memory. It, good it, stuff. It was. Um, that, that marriage would have been fantastic. It I would have been terrible. Because I, I could still see. Um, and she had not gotten her money yet. Thank you for uh, both of your inputs in that question, uh, Jane and Rochester. Alrighty, so, um, I will speak from my experience, and I'll say that um, a lot of people are marrying for status over love. We do have your young people who are marrying because they love, and they'll marry typically very young, um, but generally, marriage has become more of a business contract, I think. Um, you're talking about raising kids, which is a great expense. Mm. Um, spending a lot of time together and really sharing your money, which as we know in this capitalistic society, is your life. Would you say that you've come to uh, respect autonomy and uh, rules as a whole, or even social constructs as a whole, well, greater since your relationship? My marriage to Jane has really redefined how I view autonomy. Really? Has so it? So you'll say that, you would say that you uh, have come to respect rules and social constructs more? Absolutely. Um, not, not only within um, the confines of marriage, just respecting the the sanctity of marriage much more than when I was married to Bertha Mason. Um, but just in general, Jane has helped me to become a better person. And uh, now to you, Jane, would you say that you've developed um, a greater understanding of passion since your relationship with Rochester began? Absolutely. He is such a passionate, loving man. And now that he loves my God, just as m much as me. That just makes me love him even more. It strengthened this, our relationship. All right, thank you very much. Um, we do have one more question for uh, the lovely lady Jane tonight. So, mm. um, Jane, would you say that uh, you would rather be a woman now or uh, back in Victorian era? Uh, based on how gender roles have developed since that time. Okay, well glad you specified that because right now I love indoor plumbing But um, probably still now uh, because women are stronger. I think women have a lot more Flexibility, you know two women can marry each other now. Like how how great is that? All right, well, thank you for uh, your input in that matter. Thank you very much, Jane and Rochester. You're welcome. Uh, for joining us. I hope you have a safe Any trip back. Anytime. All right. And uh, dear viewers slash listener slash reader, uh, we will have to say goodbye. And thank you very much for listening. All right. See you later. Goodbye.